I saw my baby crying hard as babe could cry. What could I do? My baby's love had gone and left my baby blue. What could I do? <laughs> uh, might got a bit out of tune there at the end, but never mind. Hello and welcome back to another episode and today I want to talk about and to celebrate uh, two things and that is first of all my love for the Labyrinth film, a wonderful movie from 1986, uh, a real showcase for I suppose a slightly darker side of Jim, H Jim Henson productions and, and the puppetry uh, and the, and the, the, the visual inventiveness that, that that man and his studio could, could, uh, could create. But also the second thing I want to celebrate is is the life of of David Bowie. Um, obviously, he did a lot more than just play Jareth the Goblin King in the movie The Labyrinth. But really, that was the first big introduction that I had to to uh, to David Bowie was uh, was as the Goblin King. And obviously, over the years, his music, his image, his his uh, in that sense fashion sense. Obviously, I don't reflect it remotely, but his uh, his his status as a British icon has has really. Uh, obviously been important, it's, it's an important thing undeniably. Uh, and also to be honest actually his humanity, he was a very private person, a very in that sense uh, humble it seems person. Um, uh, once heard him say in an interview that he uh, he um, doesn't like, didn't like performing, it was just unfortunate that he was good at it. So he was in a very interesting character and, and, and my I suppose abiding longest and fondest memory of him is as Jareth the Goblin King in the Labyrinth uh, movie. So um, yeah, made in 1986 and starring uh, a young Jennifer Connelly and goodness me, I mean, um, oh, Jennifer Connelly. Anyway, <laughs> she's, basically, yeah, she's playing a, a, a fairly angsty, whiny uh, character called Sarah. And to be honest, she's not very, I don't know, not very relatable. I don't really like Sarah. Uh, certainly not at the beginning of this movie because she's just, it's not fair! And she's so melodramatic. Goblin King, take this baby away! Um, all because her mum and dad, God forbid, want to go out for a night and actually enjoy themselves for once. And um, and and the response which, which occurs is fascinating. Uh, the Goblin King, supposedly, and his goblin minions hear Jennifer's, uh, or rather say Sarah's call, um, and, and they take Toby, her little brother, away from her. And then she has to embark on, a, on an adventure across a labyrinth, through a goblin city, and eventually to the castle beyond. Now, the first time I watched this movie, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect. I, uh, I was just sort of told by a friend in school, you have to watch this. Come over to mine, we'll watch it, we'll watch it one time. So I went over to his house and we watched it on, on, on VHS, of course, on video. And, and uh, you know, as the beginning of the film was going, I wasn't all that convinced the music, uh, although good, wasn't you know uh, stunning. The uh, the setup wasn't particularly gripping. Um, but what I suppose got my attention was just as uh, as Sarah begins her adventure. The first thing really that she bumps into is uh, a character called Hoggle. This sort of uh, sort of uh, goblin man thing, who's who's peeing into uh, a pond. And right from then, I thought. This isn't this isn't what I expected. This isn't a, a Muppets show, or this isn't a a, a completely um, straight down the line ch child uh, children's adventure. This is something a bit darker. And so there he is, peeing into a pond, and <laughs> and, uh, and Sarah is is I suppose thrown into this labyrinth um, world. Now I'm not going to talk about or ruin the story too much here, but what I will say is that all the way through. She comes across such a bewildering range of um, of special effects, of puppetry, of um, of really charming and elegant uses of optical illusions, that the film, even if you're not particularly into her as a character, the film keeps your attention and it keeps you coming back for more. Uh, I, I do remember at some points getting a little bit bored, but then suddenly something else would happen which would be really interesting and cool. Um, in particular, I really like the um, the puppet of the of the caterpillar, this tiny little caterpillar who's, um, hello, <laughs> don't go that way. Never go that way. Um, and uh, he's got this little red scarf on, and um, 
and uh, and you sort of hear as she goes, oh thank you, and goes off in the other direction. That uh, that the, oh she'd gone that way, she'd have got straight to that goblin castle. We oh. <laughs> it's these little injections of humour, which which actually Jim Henson puts into most of his films, but in this film it feels like they're able to have a this sort of darker edge to it, which was which was very very uh, welcome. Um, other puppets of note include actually one of the most inventive is the hands. There's this sort of hole that she falls down where these hands grab her. And and, they, and uh, you have these sort of faces being created so where, where yeah, different uh, m multiple hands will create the face. So you'll have like, like maybe the eye and then the nose and then someone will do a mouth. And they're all painted to look a bit like, a bit like mossy stone. And they're constantly moving, turning into different hands. Um, and uh, it, it's 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 arresting in that sense. It's, it's visually arresting and it, and it sticks with you, especially as a child. It really, really does uh, stick with you. I also really enjoy the, the door knockers. Um, if you haven't seen the film, you simply should, but if you have, you'll know what I mean. There's a door knocker uh, who's got uh, the ring. He's like a, a brass sort of figure um, attached to a door, just his head, with a ring going from his ears. And that means he can't hear anything. He's like, what? What are you saying? This kind of thing. Like, shut up. Um, or, you know, talk louder kind of thing. You know, you're always moaning. Um, and then the other guy um, has, has a ring in his mouth. So he can't talk. He can hear the person who can't hear. And the person who can't hear obviously can't really hear anything uh, coming from this guy because he's got a ring in his mouth. And he's sort of like, and then she pulls the ring out of this guy's mouth and he's able to talk. And it's, again, it's just visually stunning and, and impressive and cool and, and, and impressive. Now, um, David Bowie as Jareth the Goblin King is an interesting one because he doesn't look like a goblin um, and they don't try to make him look like a goblin. He's basically a glam rock, um, uh, I don't know, glam rock diva living in a castle surrounded by little puppets. It's, it's an interesting mixture, interesting visual choice. And uh, when, when I was a kid, I did hear sort of some of the older kids sort of saying, oh yeah, yeah, David Bowie with the sock down his trousers. I didn't really understand that until I got a bit older. Um, <laughs> but he's got, he's got a style. David Bowie is undeniably uh, cool in this film. Uh, he's doing this thing where he's, he's juggling a crystal. Now don't worry, I know he's not actually juggling the crystal. This sort of ball is going up the hand and then down the hand, then up the hand, and then, and then he'll swap hands and it'll sort of go back and forth and they'll... Uh, apparently what happened was they had a, like a hand double. So someone would actually sort of have their arm around in front of him, juggling the crystal as he was doing his lines. Um, because it's a very difficult skill to learn and obviously he also had to learn to sing and dance and, and do the lines for this movie. So he had lots on his plate, juggling crystals was probably a bit too much. But he has some fantastic lines in this film. Um, things like, uh, turn back Sarah, turn back before it's too late. <laughs> it's, the, it's the delivery, which I can't do. I'm not trying to you know, do a good impression of David Barry. Um, but it's just undeni undeniably uh, Bowie-ish. Um, uh, what's the other one? Um, oh, nothing, nothing, tra-la-la! <laughs> Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you won't know what I'm talking about. You simply have to watch this film. It's, it's, it's a great piece. Um, Sarah bumps into a series of allies on her adventure, including a, a monster called Ludo, who sort of um, uh, is this big sort of orangutan with horns, I guess, kind of creature, who can call up rocks with his voice. Um, she uh, she bumps into a, a fox who's a knight who rides a dog that's very much like her dog uh, back in the real world. And in that sense, there's lots of little sort of echoes between uh, the real world or, or her real life and then the Goblin Kingdom or her dream. I mean, just like Alice in Wonderland, it's all a bit subjective. You can decide what you think's going on at the end almost. Um, and it's actually all really informed by the fact that, that Sarah is learning uh, the lines at the beginning of the film for a play which is basically called Labyrinth. And it's, it's, it's a play which is basically this story. So it could be that she's just because she's so imaginative, she's just gone off on a flight of fancy. It could actually be that she is, in fact, um, having to, to battle through the labyrinth to get her little uh, baby brother back. Um, that doesn't really matter, though. What matters is is the story and what she learns, I, I suppose, about herself uh, as she uh, continues. She has 13 hours to solve the, the, the labyrinth, and there are various places and points when it becomes very unfair. and. And, uh, and and all the way through, the Goblin King is trying to to, uh, to obfuscate and and um, otherwise be, put hurdles in Sarah's uh, path. Uh, for example, 
um, when she draws like arrows on the floor in lipstick. Uh, this is wonderful, all these wonderful segments where a little creature, the creatures will sort of, you know, raise this the, from up, from below the, uh, the sort of the, the, the paving stone up. And they go, oh, I've got it, I've got it, yeah, I've got it, okay, turn it, and they'll turn it and just change the orientation. So she's constantly getting lost. Uh, having to solve riddles, walls are moving in in behind her. It's it's a really cool story, and actually, it reminded me as a child of the board game Labyrinth. And actually, one day I'll have to do a, a let's play of a board game with you, of the board game Labyrinth by Ravensburger. That's quite an interesting game as well. It's not the you know it's not the best game you'll ever play, but I sort of connected the two in my mind as a child, um, certainly. Um, of course, there's the Bog of Eternal Stench, again, another really creative um, uh, addition to the film. And there's only really one bit where the special effects really fall down. And I don't know, if, don't know if this is just in the collector's edition, which I have. Um, uh, and that is, there's a segment with these, these creatures these, which can take off their own heads, and they're sort of juggling heads and swapping heads around. And uh, there's some terrible green screen in that sequence. Um, and uh, re-watching it the other day, actually I watched it the day after the news of, um, of Barry's death came out on Monday. I watched it on Monday, sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, the green screen's terrible in that section. But really, the reason why you notice it is because the special effects in the rest of the film are so good. And uh, little optical things like uh, where a wall is or isn't, or emerging from a pot which is apparently raised off the ground uh, when it looks like you've been climbing up through a tunnel. Again, watch the film and you'll, and you'll see exactly what it is I'm getting at. One thing which really, I think, which, which sort of haunted me as a child, though, was this moment where she's in a rubbish dump and she's sort of being, again, lulled into a false sense of security. Oh, you're back in your room, dear. It's okay. Just go to sleep. And there's this, there's this old woman puppet with lots of stuff on her back. Very, actually, very similar to a puppet which we saw uh, being deployed recently in uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens. Um, and this little old lady is, uh, is scary and unnerving. And the reason why I like this sequence um, is that this is sort of facsimile of her room, which as she starts to realise that, that it's not real, starts just to fall apart. Wallpaper comes off the walls, you can see the slats of the walls behind, and then all the rubbish from the dump starts pouring in, and it feels exactly what it's like to have a dream which collapses as a child. If you've ever had this happen to you when you were a child, when, when a dream just starts to fall, you start to realise this isn't real, and it all just sort of goes wrong and twisted and, and it was captured on film perfectly in this sequence in the labyrinth. Um, I, I know people who, who feel the same in fact, there are, there are people who watch this as a child as well who have talked about that sequence with and they go, yes, absolutely, I completely understand where you're coming from. Then again, there are other people, my wife included unfortunately, who didn't see the labyrinth until they were adults. And a little bit like her experience with Star Wars, this has left her slightly cold to the film. She sees all the negatives, the whiny character characterization, the it's at times outdated special effects, the, uh, the strange costume of Bowie, and she doesn't sort of, I suppose, uh, soak up what it was that we were getting as we watched it as children. And it's such a shame that she didn't get to experience this, I suppose, at the right age. Um, and maybe that's something, maybe that's something actually, if you haven't watched the film yet, maybe you shouldn't, maybe you won't enjoy it. But I would, I would, I would hope, even if you're an adult and you haven't seen it, that you can watch this film with the right mindset and get into it and just go on this journey because it's really well done. It's so imaginative. There's too much to talk about really in terms of the, the, the imaginative presentation of characters, the way that transformations happen in, in like there's a gate that closes that becomes like this sort of automaton robot steam powered guard for, for the castle. Um, it's such a good film and really very much well worth watching and rightly is considered to be a classic and a great late 80s movie so definitely give it a go if you haven't. Um, I don't want to dwell too much on the death of Bowie because I think David Bowie was always about looking forward. He was a forward-looking person. He didn't even like reflecting on his own life and his own career uh, and therefore I'm not going to do that today. What I will though say is publicly say a hearty thank you to that man for for delivering such a wonderful character in, in the Labyrinth movie and for doing it in a way which actually, funnily enough, took it quite seriously. You know, he, he can tell he's having fun, um, but he's also taking, he's giving the role the dues that, it's, that it deserves. You know, it's not Shakespeare, of course it's not, and, and he, he's not playing it like that, but he's playing it 
as though Jareth, the character that he is, uh, has a uh, has an agenda, and uh, and in that sense, along with the songs, along with the dancing, along with the the sock uh, down the crotch, um, or not, who knows? You know, I'm not going to speculate too much on on Bowie and his crotch, um, but along with all that. Uh, out, out comes this, this wonderful performance and it, it, it's always going to be important to me. So David Bowie, rest in peace and um, if you haven't seen The Labyrinth, definitely go out and give it a go. As ever guys, until next time, do take care. Bye bye.